Come, O long-expected Jesus, born to set your people free from our sins and fears release us. Let us find our rest in you. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth you are, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Born your people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now your gracious kingdom bring. By your own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone. By your all-sufficient merit, raise us to your glorious throne. Amen. The gift of kingship in Israel, um, you know that despite God's misgivings and right misgivings about kingship, um, at the people's request, God eventually gave them a king, Saul. And then when Saul failed in his task, David. And from David you have the dynasty of kings and the hope of kingship in Israel. Now, whereas the theme of kingship in Israel and the prophecies concerning kingship were just one among many of the gifts and the hopes that the Israelites had in the post-exilic period leading up to the time of Christ and then in the New Testament, the promise of a coming king <coughs> the Messiah was the promise of all promises. All the other promises of God eventually connected with and were funneled through this promise, the promise of a coming king. And as you all know, the fundamental confession of faith of us as Christians is that Jesus is the Messiah, Mashiach, the Christ, the anointed king. Um, so uh, you won't understand our Christian faith unless you see that kingship and a unique kind of kingship, a countercultural kind of kingship lies at the heart of it. <coughs> um, God's gift of kingship um, and the theology of kingship is focused on God's covenant with David. Remember we had God's covenant with Abraham, the covenant of Mount Sinai, now um, the last and greatest of all the covenants, the covenant with David. Um, let's have a look at its foundational word in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 11 to 16. Now you need to take this together with the two other passages I have here, but we have a limited space of time. Josh, can you read... Um, Second uh, uh, Samuel 7, 11b through to 16. Remember the context? David decides to build a house, a temple for God. But he runs it past Nathan the prophet and says, check this out with God. Nathan says, yeah, that sounds like a good, pious thing to do. Go ahead. And then that night God speaks to Nathan and sends him back to David and said, no, David, you are not to build me a house. I want to build you a house. But your son, the one who comes from your body, your heir, will build my house. Now, there's a lot of punning going on here. House. House is literally a building, but it can be household or family or royal dynasty, but it also means temple. Okay, uh, can you uh, take this through, Josh, stage by stage, and I'll tell you to pause uh, at particular places. Moreover, the Lord declares to me that the Lord will make you a house. Now, that's a good translation. So, will make you a house. Now, it could be taken in two senses. The obvious sense is that God will make David, or for David, a 
dynasty. But it could also be saying, and that's the obvious sense here, I will make a house for you. But remember the discussion here is about temple. Um, it could also be that God promises that he will make David his temple, his house. Now this is not picked up in the Old Testament at all further, but it's picked up in the New Testament because who is the house of God? Jesus' body, Jesus body is the house of God. Um, John's Gospel uh, picks this up and runs with it. But notice that exegetical option. One of the problems with translation from Hebrew is that it needs to decide between open exegetical options. In a sense, it narrows down possibility of meaning. Keep going now, Josh. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring up who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Just stop there. A house for my name means a temple for my name. I will make you a house, a dynasty, your seed, your descendant, someone who comes from your body, so direct descendant, direct male descendant, will build my temple, my house. Um, and notice here you get the first forever. Highlight the four forevers here. This is the first forever. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Keep going. I will be him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Just stop there. Um, on the face of it, this is an adoption formula. Um, in the ancient world, say if I was marrying a woman, I, was, I would say to her, you will be to me, I will be to you a husband, and you will be to me my wife. If I was adopting you, I'd say, I will be to you for a father, and you will be to me for a son. So, um, it could be, on the, it, number one, it's an adoption formula, um, but it also is a recognition of sonship. Saying, now, if, if there was some doubt about who was my son, I'd say, you are to me a son, and I am to you a father meaning you're my son, I'm your father. So it could be a recognition formula or an adoption formula. Keep going. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the strife of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Now steadfast love is keseth. In the Septuagint, it's translated by mercy, um, uh, usually translated steadfast love. It is more um, closely connected with grace, generosity, mercy. Uh, I won't go into it, but that translation, steadfast love, has its own whole complicated theory behind it. Notice that in the Septuagint, it's translated as mercy, grace, eleos. Now, um, what's being said here? Unlike Saul, because Saul's sin, his dynasty was wiped out. But God says here of David's dynasty, if one of his sons, who is a king, sins, who will be punished? Only the king that sins. The dynasty won't be punished. So, um, uh, the sins of a member of the dynasty will not result in the extinction of the dynasty. The punishment will come upon the king, but not on the dynasty. Now, if you read First and Second Kings very closely, there's a very interesting history of that for the descendants of David. At one point, the dynasty of David was reduced to one person. And that was, uh, he was... Uh, preserved miraculously. So, uh, the dynasty will be punished, but not, I mean, not the, the person will be punished, but not the dynasty. Last of all. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. 
Right on. Now, notice verse 15. There is a never, um, which in Hebrew is not forever. And now you get two last forevers. Your house and your kingdom will endure how long? Forever before me. Before me means in my presence. And probably has to do with the connection between the dynasty of the descendants of David and the temple of God, where you have the presence of God. Um, your house and your kingdom will endure forever where? Before me, in my presence. And your throne will be established forever. Now let's just take it here. One of the problems with this prophecy is that it has a um, three-point uh, frame of reference. Parts of this prophecy have to do with David. Parts of it have to do with the descendant of David, the immediate descendant of David. And some parts of it have to do with some future king. Notice the forever here. I'm going to come back to that. Um, Okay, perpetual dynasty. Whose perpetual dynasty will last forever? Which one of these do I have to tick? David. David. The dynasty of David lasts forever. Whose kingship will last forever? I didn't notice it's not the kingship of David. He died. The kingship of Solomon had a long reign. He died. Okay. The only possibility is a future king. Now notice that this is going beyond the range of normal expectations. Um, thirdly, whose throne is going to last forever? David's, David's throne. Through David's Through and only secondarily through there, through there. Um, uh, even Jesus sits on the throne of David. Uh, but uh, the throne itself, so there's a difference between kingship. Kingship is the person who occupies the throne. The um, throne is the institution itself. The dynasty is the family from which the uh, particular occupant comes. Uh, right, oh, and the, uh, say, so, so the dynasty is the whole family. The throne doesn't belong to the whole family. The throne is occupied by a particular person in the family. Uh, okay, your father's a pastor. Uh, that, uh, you know, that's in your family, but not all of you are pastors. Uh, almost. Uh, you're, you're doing a good job there. Now, notice then, um, uh, and this is a very important term because this term keseth is used again and again in connection with kingship and then the Messiah in the New Testament. Now, um, as I said, this is usually translated as steadfast love. Um, it's more closely, better translated as generosity or grace or mercy. Um, David is not a king by divine right, but he's a king by divine keseth, grace, a gift. It's a gift, not a right. He's not a king by divine right. He's a king by divine grace, mercy, a gift, generosity. Now, um, notice that uh, uh, David's, uh, God's generosity is perpetual to whom? Did God ever withdraw his grace from David? Ben? No. Did he withdraw it from Solomon? Yes. There's a question mark there. Okay, did he, will he ever withdraw his grace, his mercy from the Messiah? Ben? 
no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now, uh, uh, next. The promise is that uh, uh, some people are going to be a temple builder. Uh, is David the temple builder? No. Who's the temple builder? The son that comes from his body, Solomon. At least he builds the first temple. But who builds the eternal temple? We've got one option left. <laughs> got one option left. I don't, you, see, you see the way it is? Now, I'm doing this quite methodically because don't go into either or. This refers to Solomon exclusively or it refers to the Messiah exclusively. Um, lastly, divine sonship. Is David a son of God? If you read the accounts very carefully, David is never ever referred to as God's son. Who's referred to as God's son? Solomon. And then when you get the promises of the Messiah coming, he's going to be the son of God. Now what's the difference between Solomon and the coming Messiah? And, and, and now we go beyond the Old Testament options. Now remember, the exegetical options are open. It could be adopted son or real son, begotten son. So it could be an unbegotten son or a begotten son. Does that ring a bell with your creedal stuff and Christology? The only begotten son. Um, so what's uh, uh, the status of Solomon a son? What kind of a son is he? He's the adopted son of God. Um, and it seems that all the descendants of Solomon had the status of adopted son. Now I connect this then with house. Who is the person who is in charge of the house of his father? The son is. Which son? The elder son, the heir. So son, house, um, goes together. Now the house here, and this is if you, when you read particularly First and Second Chronicles, but also some of stuff in the Psalms, um, uh, the king has response as God's son has responsibility for the house of God. What's the house of God? You could say the house of God is his family, Israel, but it's also the temple of God. So he is a temple patron. Um, Jesus is the divine son of God. Now notice that uh, uh, this is not clearly adumbrated in the Old Testament, but the exegetical options there are open. Now it can be either adopted son or a begotten son. Now any questions on this important, important, important prophecy? I've laboured it because of its huge importance. Yes? Um, you, you've got there the, the ongoing grace of Christ and I don't want to dispute that but I do wonder about when he was on the cross and he calls out to God saying that he's been forsaken. Yes. How do we understand that grace is still in that? Okay, well then you've got to take one other part there, is that, and I haven't got these, the promises, but there's one warning. There's only one negative note here in this. What's the negative note? Oh, discipline. Is, yeah, just read that, please, Tom. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with, with the stripes of the sons of men. Right ho. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. Okay. The one, the king who sins will be disciplined and God will hand him over to human beings for disciplining, for punishment. Rodding is to teach him a lesson. Um, now, what's the irony here? When it comes to New Testament, Jesus is the one who is sin-free and yet what happens? He's the one that's punished. And the, the, the amazing thing that is that this is God's grace at work. The king is not just a king by the grace of God. Okay, that's Old Testament. But the king is the administer of God's grace. 
And he, um, uh, in a sense, there's this great exchange that involved that uh, uh, Josh spoke about yesterday in his sermon. The great exchange. The punishment that should have come on us comes on him. And he's punished for the sins that he never committed. Uh, so that his grace can be extended to sinners. Now this is going way, way beyond what's immediately at stake here. Um, uh, but it's all that stuff in the New Testament only comes out in its sharp relief if you see it against this Old Testament stuff. Any other questions on this? What is stripes? Stripes is whips. Uh, well, no, stripes is with a rod. Hittings. By his stripes we are healed because he was beaten. It's the action stripe. It's it's um, well actually the Hebrew words can both be the thing that you hit somebody with and the hittings, um, the thing you hit them with and uh, they're being hit. Is a thrust stripe can just mean a mathematical line. Line there. Yeah. It's not stripes in that sense. No, it leaves. What it leaves? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's where one of the the connections. Strokes, but even stroke is not right. Um, uh, beatings. By his beatings, we you now he will be hit with a beat. You know, he will be what punished by the beatings of men. The picture is of a teacher disciplining a student, or a father disciplining, probably a father disciplining a son, is the picture. You now, getting the cane out and giving him a good belting. Now, um, uh, one yes. Uh, did you have something there? Is that, is that verse of discipline, is that exclusively messianic, or is there... Or no, because if, uh, if you like, it's, it's, uh, you'll see the content of that in what follows in First and Second Kings. Um, those kings, those descendants of David, who were not faithful in keeping God's covenant, what happened to them? They died, they were punished, and various kinds of punishment... Whereas those kings who were faithful to God prospered. Yeah, Hezekiah, Josiah. Hezekiah, Josiah, um, so on. So, uh, Picky, Hezekiah was the great example of this. So when we hear uh, you know, King Ahaz or whatever did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yep. That's, that's this, the fulfilment of this prophecy. And that's mentioned there because of this prophecy. Saying, ha uh -huh, notice... What God had threatened to do there, he is doing now. This is a foundational passage. It's not just one among many, but you found the theology of kingship. And it gives you the key, the hermeneutic key, to understanding God's dealings with David and Solomon and folly. Um, even with David, what happened to him? Remember that he is not only a righteous man, but he is the great sinner. He commits adultery, he commits murder, and as a result of that, remember that when um, Nathan came to him, uh, no, remember he uh, 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 pinned him down, and he said that the person, he told that parable of the lamb, he said that this person should get fourfold punishment. Uh, if you look at the account of Solomon, um, David is punished four ways because of his sin with Bathsheba and his murder. The judgment of God comes upon him. Because he has the grace of God and because of this covenant, God punishes sinners. But he doesn't punish the dynasty, even the dynasty of David. And it, it, uh, absolutely astonishing. Uh, theology here. And can I repeat again? This is the hermeneutical key to understand the history of kingship that's unpacked in 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and then later in, uh, in another different mode, in 1 and 2 Chronicles. Yep. Yeah, Josh? Um, the, just what David was saying about the... Um on the cross, being forsaken. Is that, um, is that the Jewish argument, though? The Jewish argument is the opposite. 
Cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. Yes. This is, look, this is Paul puts the Jewish argument, uh, the argument that he had for uh, rejecting Christ. And the argument was very simple. Um, the argument goes as follows. Uh, the Messiah is the Holy Blessed One. Is that right? Is it right? Yes. 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 He is the Holy Blessed One. Um, uh, Jesus cannot be the Holy Blessed Messiah. Why? Because he is cursed. How come he's cursed? Two ways. He was put to death. He was sentenced to death by whom? The Sanhedrin and the high priest who represents God. Now he, the high priest is the representative of God. In office in the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin is the God's supreme court established on earth. It's established by God. It's founded by God. It's instituted by God. The high priest in office there represents God. He's, Jesus is put to death by God, and he's not just put to death in a nice way. He's put to death in the way of a person who is cursed by God. What does cursed by God mean? Rejected by God. And you see, that's a powerful argument. And I've read it over and over again, not just from Jews, but many other critics of Christianity. That's the Jewish argument against Jesus being the Messiah. And that's what lies behind the theology of the cross. What's Paul's answer to that? That was his reason for rejecting Jesus. How come he changed his mind? Bright lights. But there, yeah, bright lights not just out there. He saw Jesus and he saw the exalted Lord Jesus. And what light then dawned up inside here? That the curse of Christ is apparently bearing as his curse. Yeah. Remember, you get it summed up beautifully in Galatians chapter 3. Um, the one who knew no sin became a cursed for us, so that the blessing of Abraham, which should have belonged to the Messiah, comes on us, the people who should have been cursed by God. Anyone who breaks the law of God is cursed. We're all under God's curse. Um, Jesus is the only one who's not under curse. He takes on the curse so that we can have the blessing. Um, fantastic theology. And it confounds human expectations. Um, and it lies at the heart of our Lutheran theology. Lose that and you lose your reason to be a Lutheran. And I'd say you lose your reason to be a Christian. Um, the option then is to be a Jew or Mohammedan. Uh, because if that's not the case, then Jesus is an imposter. He's a good guru, a good man, but he's not the Messiah, he's not the Son of God. That's the only way he can be the Messiah. Right, does that, who, yes, you asked that question. Very, you know, notice that we come here right to the heart of Christology. The last thing I'd like to emphasize is, notice this term here, perpetual, <coughs> When would this word have become particularly important in the history of Israel? It's not. Why? Because it comes into question. Why has it come into question? Because it's been wiped out. They're not in their homeland anymore. Not the, the dynasty hasn't been wiped out. Sure. No king. No There's no king. king. Even when they, God gave them the temple he destroyed, he gave back to them. The land that he destroyed, he gave back to them. Um, the priests, everything else is given back to them. What's the one thing that they didn't get back after the exile? Kings. Kings. And it wasn't just a short term, but it was from 586 onwards, there was no king. Now, there's two exegetical options or theological options that you can go. Um, uh, you know, that this would have bothered people, this passage. Just imagine yourself as a good theologian, say 400 BC, and you look at this passage. There's two options 
uh, interpretive options available for you. What are they? When you read this four times, forever, forever, forever. It's either a lie. It's either a lie or King's coming. King's it's, it doesn't just refer to David and that line of kings, political line of kings that ended there in 586, but the great king, the one who will out Solomon, Solomon is still to come. And you know which of those options um, became the dominant interpretation in that post-exilic period? And it became stronger and stronger. You can see it growing in strength up to the time of Christ. The messianic thing. Um, so that messianic hope becomes clearer and more certain. And the foundation for that messianic hope lies here. Uh, for the foundation for all the messianic psalms is here. The foundation for all the messianic promises that we're going to look at shortly lies here. The foundation for that hope of the coming Messiah lies here. And to the present day, why do Jews wear the Star of David around their neck? Why is the Star of David the, the, on the Jewish flag? Theologically? Because the Messiah is still to come. All pious Jews look for the coming Messiah. It's only liberal Jews or secular Jews that uh, demythologize that. But pious Jews still look for the coming Messiah. Because those who claim to be Messiahs, in their understanding, didn't fit the bill. The Messiah is yet to come. There's only one difference between Jews and Christians. What's that? If you go right down to the foundation, the Messiah has come. Who is the Messiah? Jesus. Jesus. So we say Jesus Messiah, they say Jesus no Messiah. Um, they have Messiah question mark. And they're always looking for the Messiah. And that, I was just reading about one in the, was it the 19th century or something. Yes. He came in Israel and he had hundreds of thousands of followers. Hmm. And, um, and I thought this was it. And then he ended up sleeping with a number of women and impregnating yep. a whole lot. Yep. And died and some unholy death. The whole history, the whole history of no. Judaism from here on, from, from say 500 onwards, is of people who come pretending to be the Messiah. Um, the latest was um, a Lieber witch, who was a uh, head of a Hasidic group in New York. Big following here in Australia too, um, who died just two or three years ago, I forget. No, his followers believed that he was the Messiah. It's desperate for it. It's, That's, it's this desperate hope. And look, even, it's not just Jews, why was Rudd elected? Why was Obama, Obama elected? Go behind the politics to the theology. Save the world. Okay, he's going to save the world. He's the Messiah. And even, you know, what lies behind the Hitlers and Stalins of the world? They get support because they promise to be Messiahs. Um, saving people. Straightening out the mess the world is in. Um, just... Two uh, cases in intertestamental history. Um, you may or may not know that uh, uh, a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus led the revolt of the Jews against the Romans around about 180 BC. Uh, not against the Romans, the Greeks. And was. What? The author of Maccabees. Sorry? Is that the author of Maccabees? No, yeah. no, the Maccabees tells this story. And if you want to read the whole story of this, read First and Second Maccabees. Okay? You had Judas Maccabeus, great man. Um, and he had uh, three brothers. Um, now, he drove out the Romans and established, re-established the Jewish people as an independent political entity. Um, there were a lot of people then who said, ha ha, here, now we've got the Messiah. And yet every... Jew who knew the Old Testament knew that Judas Maccabeus couldn't possibly be the Messiah. Why? It's not a, in the line of death. What uh, tribe did he come from? He's not only not from the tribe of Judah, he's not from the uh, uh, tribe of family. He is a priestly. His father was a priest. 
And so he is of the tribe of Levi. And all his descendants were priests. So he was a priest. And since he was a priest, he couldn't be king. Simple as that. In the time of Jesus, you had another person, and if you read history closely, if you read Josephus, and if you look at his coins, you can see that this man had claims to be the Messiah. In fact, he actually rebuilt the temple because he wanted to establish his credentials as Messiah. Who was it? Herod. You won't understand Herod politically unless you can see that he wanted to be recognized as the Messiah. Now, why was it that almost all Jews unanimously, apart from those that had some political advantage, rejected Herod? You don't know your history, do you? Wrong line, don't Wrong? It's not only a wrong line. He was an Edomite, not a Jew. But he married into the Davidic family. He had to have two things. He, 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 he established alliances with the priests, for theological reasons and then for messianic reasons he married into the Davidic line so that he could borrow and then he obscured his own uh, birth stuff and he invented false genealogies to show that he was in some way um, Davidic okay? and um, then you had the, the revolt against the Romans uh, led by oh gosh senior moment 170 AD no uh, uh, no not 70 AD there was other messianic stuff there but later on there was a second revolt against the Romans where the guy um, he'll come to me claimed to be the Messiah um, and some of the greatest rabbis that we hear about in the Mishnah gave him support um, uh, but he then also proved to be a false messiah. The whole history of Judaism is about messiahs uh, who didn't, uh, who claimed to, people claimed to be the messiah and disappointed the people. Yes? Is there some of that, do you find some of that in John's Gospel? I remember reading something where they say Jesus is Lord. Yes. Is that a bit of a play on like the Caesars who used to say Caesar is Lord? That's that, another, yep. That kind of yep. Well, that's a different thing because you have. Uh, that's dominos in Latin, kurios in Greek, um, uh, but then kurios uh, in Greek is adon, which is the word used for Yahweh in the Old Testament. So the confession of Jesus as Lord is both political and theological. Uh, political, um, the confession that Jesus is Lord is anti Caesar. Because Caesar thought he was Son of God. Well, uh, uh, Caesar Augustus had only had the title that he was Dominus, Lord. But Domitian, remember, um, uh, around about 80 AD, um, instituted the practice that throughout his, you know, the empire was fracturing and he had needed to have some ideology to keep people together. And so he um, uh, made it mandatory that anybody who wanted to have bear office within the Roman Empire, anybody who wanted to have a license to trade, had to once a year go before an instant altar in front of a statue of Domitian and say, Hail Domitian, my Lord and my God, Dominus et Deus. Which, by the way, is Thomas's confession of faith. Jesus is Lord and God, my Lord and my God. Um, so what's implicit there Dominus. It could be taken purely politically, but there's always religious stuff everywhere in the ancient world. Politics always religion. Like uh, Lord and God. Christ the King has come to function with that double meaning in modern times, at least a little bit. It's got that political. And yes. So at one time, it's a it's a messianic, uh, just Jesus the Messiah. For yes. Moment. But when we say, at least when people have said in the last sort of century, Christ is. King, yes. it's also a slight pointed attack. At it's anti-monarchy. Anti we're not serving you. Yes. We're, uh, yeah. Righto, in the Hitler era, um, no, uh, Karl Barth, Bonhoeffer and Zasse uh, basically got a coalition of Christians against um, Hitler because they said around the confession of Jesus as 
Lord. Hitler is not Lord. He's not Herr. Jesus is our only Lord. We have no other Lord except Jesus. Um, yes? I was just going to say, so, um, just with this, that uh, the story goes that yeah, uh, Israel didn't get kings because they're always divine in all the other neighboring regions and they yes. wanted them and wanted them. But God does give a That's right. divinity in this. It's not as if he eradicates it. But I suppose maybe the diffusion to is that it's a promise somehow. Yeah, no. It's, it, it's, it's somehow future looking and also within it contains discipline as well. So it's not a complete um, carte blanche for, for whatever you do is good. Um, but also it, it is a subject, but also then the divinity is there, um, but it's, it's, it's not completely fulfilled yet, sort of. That's also. right. Um, so uh, within paganism, in a sense, lies a hope a spiritual hope that cannot be fulfilled by human beings. Look, you'll see this kind of reshaping of stuff everywhere in the Bible. God takes what is natural in human language, in human culture, and he turns it upside down or back to front. Um, so what had to happen in is what has to happen is that kingship had to be purged of its um, pagan um, connotations before it could function um, as an instrument for God's grace of its mythological pagan things. So what happens then, God, and this is part of the whole process of the incarnation, God uh, takes human things, purifies them, sanctifies them, turns them, reverses them, and then uses that as an instrument um, uh, to redeem people. Yeah, and that's, that, I reckon just lately I've heard more and more that argument, an argument against Christianity is that it's just a, a remodeled kind of paganism. They just borrow from everything. Yep. And, and I think the right answer is to say, Amen. Yes, yes, yes but. Actually, look at it though, and it's not. Yep. It's remodeled in a way that's that's um, that's completely unique. And right. Oh, what so happens is you say yes, but. It not only takes, but critiques it uh, radically. I could give hundreds of cases of this from the Old Testament. God taking things that, if you like, are a pagan, that are natural, um, and critiquing it, turning it around. From something as fundamental as fatherhood. Things like motherhood, sonship, servant. Uh, you know, all, all human stuff is taken and then critiqued and turned around. Um, so, uh, 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 already David is a king, but he's not a king by divine right and divine power, but he's king by grace of God. And he is not a co-ruler with God, but he is the Eveth of Yahweh, the servant of the Lord. So you get servant and king being brought together for the first time. And you see this, this, this reconfiguring, this critiquing. And as soon as um, God talks about David and his descendants as being his servants, he not only affirms kingship, but he critiques all other forms of kingship. Um, by the way, that's the basic criteria that you need to do to critique um, all our politicians. Do they actually serve? Or do they merely exercise power? Okay, I've taken far too long. Any other questions on this before I uh, continue on its application? Okay, let's have a break. Please don't make it too long because I've got quite